Tonight, the NHL commissioner addresses allegations of sexual assault leveled against players. Born, reprehensible, horrific, and unacceptable. But stop short of suspensions. I don't think that's necessary at this stage. While the league announces a return to the Olympics. Fallen American soldiers return home as the U.S. strikes back overseas. Plus, the twists and turns in the legal case against Canada's crypto king. Parts of Atlantic Canada prepare for up to 80 centimeters of snow. And remembering Carl Weathers. He was someone who had a long, varied career and worked right up until the very end. The football player turned Hollywood star. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. Hockey fans are marking the NHL's return to the Olympics, as announced today by Commissioner Gary Bettman. And while he was focused on the change, he also fielded a flurry of questions about charges against five members of Canada's 2018 World Junior Hockey Team. The NHL conducted its own investigation into the incident, but the results won't be released until the court process is complete. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver has more. The head of the NHL defended his league's culture after London police officially laid sexual assault charges against four current NHL players and one former player. This is not representative of these allegations of what takes place in our game. We believe you can and should be comfortable that this game has every intention of being welcoming, inclusive and safe. The five players are accused of sexually assaulting a young woman in a hotel room following a Hockey Canada gala in 2018, a case that was closed by the London Police Service that year, but reopened in 2022 following outrage that a lawsuit filed by the alleged victim was quietly settled by Hockey Canada. The NHL says its independent investigation concluded in the last few months. We were working with the NHL Players Association to analyze the information we had create a process to move forward and then determine what was an appropriate response when the news of the impending charges broke. The NHL players are on leave and still being paid. Bettman doesn't expect them to play anytime soon, but says at this stage, a suspension is not needed. The fact that they're away from their teams and not playing, I'm comfortable with. The comments come as the best NHLers are in Toronto for All-Star Weekend. And for the first time since 2014, the NHL revealed today its players will play in the Olympics. Obviously Canada, U.S. Um, doesn't get any better than that in hockey and um, just can't wait to uh, have a chance to be a part of that. This is great stuff. I mean, uh, our generation hasn't hasn't been able to do that as an NHL player, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm very pumped. The NHL hasn't participated in the Olympics since Sochi when Team Canada defended its Olympic title. In 2018, contract negotiations kept players away. And in 2022, the league cancelled plans to send players to China due to concerns around COVID-19. The core of the Olympic Games, it's about the world coming together and the best in the world. So that is, that is what we will celebrate again. NHL players will return to Olympic ice in 2026 and again in 2030. And for the first time, Heather, they'll be skating on a smaller NHL-sized rink. Annie, thanks for this. The U.S. has launched major retaliatory airstrikes targeting Iran-backed militants in Iraq and Syria. President Joe Biden had been warning for days the U.S. would strike back against those responsible for killing three soldiers and injuring dozens of service members. Here's CTV's Joy Malvin in Washington. Just two hours after U.S. President Joe Biden and his wife received the remains of three U.S. service members, honoring Sergeants William Rivers, Kennedy Sanders, and Brianna Moffett, killed in a drone strike on their military base in Jordan, the U.S. struck back. Using long-range bombers launching airstrikes on Iranian-linked militia targets in Syria and Iraq simultaneously, hitting facilities used by Iran's revolutionary armed guards and Iranian-backed militants. 
U.S. Central Command says U.S. military forces struck more than 85 targets, including command and control centers, intelligence centers, rockets, missiles, and munition supply facilities. Well, it sounds like it's more than just a punch in the nose, uh, which uh, some attacks we've made before were just signaling, you know, kind of one and done. It sounds like they really wanted to go after uh, these logistical supply lines like we were talking about and, and destroy them. The president and other top leaders warned for days that America would strike hard after relentless attacks, more than 160 by militias backed by Iran. The White House saying tonight it doesn't want a full-scale conflict in the region, even giving the government of Iraq a heads up before the airstrikes. Tonight, the president said the United States does not seek conflict, but if you harm an American, we will respond. Iran's president says he doesn't want conflict either, but will respond to bullies. The White House says it has no interest in a full-scale war, declaring the strikes a success tonight and sending a strong message to Iran and these militias that this is just the start of the U.S. response. Heather? Joy, thanks. And just a day after President Biden issued an executive order targeting violent Israeli settlers in the West Bank, Canada is considering sanctions of its own, as the prime minister called on Israel to do more to stem the rising violence against Palestinians. CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports. Violent clashes are on the rise between Israeli settlers and Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. <laughs> Palestinian Fathi Abu Amar says settlers are killing our children before our eyes, and we cannot do a thing. Since the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel, the UN says Jewish settlers carried out nearly 500 attacks on Palestinians, killing at least eight. With the Israeli government being accused of inaction, the Prime Minister says Canada is considering sanctions. We are looking into uh, how to make sure that those responsible uh, for extremist violence or extremist settler violence in, uh, in the West Bank uh, are held to account for it. Uh, we are looking at uh, sanctions on extremist settlers. U.S. President Joe Biden issued an executive order yesterday barring four Israeli settlers access to America's financial system and froze their bank accounts over allegations of violence. This West Bank settlement mayor says it's up to Israel to prosecute its own citizens. It is surprising that the president decided to finger point at the small extreme group of Jews who are acting violently, who are treated by the Israeli law enforcement and ignoring Palestinian violence who has been killing thousands of Jews. Palestinians hope the West Bank will become a future state, but some 500,000 Jewish settlers now live there in violation of international law. Far-right Israeli National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir has encouraged settlers to carry guns and wants to expand these Jewish communities into Gaza. Canada has condemned Ben Gavir's provocative call. Today, Prime Minister Trudeau warned settler violence threatens hope of a two-state solution. Heather? Kevin, thank you. To Ukraine now and a surprise visit from Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie. The importance of bringing back these children home cannot be understated. It is a matter of our own humanity. Jolie launched an international effort to advocate for Ukrainian children taken to Russia since the invasion in 2022. She said Canada will seek global help to bring them home. Kiev estimates thousands of children have been forcibly deported to Russia. Moscow denies the claim. The public inquiry into foreign interference wrapped up its first week of public hearings with testimony from the country's public safety minister, Dominic LeBlanc. CTV's Jeremy Charon has been following the proceedings. A final word from Public Safety Minister Dominic LeBlanc in a week of testimony focused on the sharing of information and the challenge of balancing transparency while protecting classified national security information. We do absolutely accept the need to maximize a public understanding of these issues. That is one of the best ways to detect and disrupt attempts to interfere in electoral processes. LeBlanc testified that the commission will have full access to secret documents. Some of that sensitive information just won't be made public. There is also an obligation by law uh, imposed by statute uh, on the national security agencies to protect 
uh, certain classified documents, certain classified information. This week's hearings paving the way for the next phase when the inquiry will dig into the actual allegations of foreign meddling in the 2019 and 2021 elections. We know and have long known that, known that countries like China and Russia and Iran and others are trying to influence and interfere in our democratic processes and have for years. Federal lawyers have raised concerns about the risk of sharing too much publicly, but this former CSIS head says there could be benefits. Let us look at our declassification exercise as more than simply transparency for Canadians but as an effective tool to counter foreign interference from Canada's adverse adversaries. The government's lawyers have also flagged concerns over the timeline and the amount of work required to review and redact large amounts of classified documents. Yes, I think that is that will likely be a problem uh, because sometimes the reporting can be voluminous and you got to go through it carefully. Now, the next round of public hearings is set for the end of March, with a third round tentatively scheduled for September. The final report, Heather, is due by the end of the year. Jeremy Chiron in Ottawa. Strong words today from the Prime Minister over Alberta's proposed new gender rules, saying the province is fighting against vulnerable transgender kids. But when asked how his government will respond to the policy becoming law, he offered few specifics. CTV's Sarah Plowman has more. Ace Peace has been an advocate for transgender rights for years. This was him at Calgary Pride seven years ago. It was better then for trans youth to exist than it is now. He's reacting to Premier Danielle Smith's plan to ban gender affirming surgeries to anyone under 18 and ban hormonal treatment and puberty blockers for anyone under 16. The time in between coming out as trans and accessing care is when people are the most vulnerable. The Premier says she's protecting trans children's choices. The Prime Minister slammed that idea. Danielle Smith has now moved forward with the most anti-LGBT policies of anywhere in the country. Some doctors say the move makes a medical issue political and handcuffs their ability to help patients. The myth of this is that a youth could come into a clinic and instantly receive her hormones, instantly have some kind of surgeries done because they wanted it. This is a huge process. It's very systematic. Alberta is also proposing a pronoun policy like New Brunswick's, where students under 16 need a parent's consent before changing their name or pronoun at school. New Brunswick's premier was asked whether he'll bring in similar policies as Alberta. We don't have any particular plans um, at this point. But the whole idea is to keep looking at, at what are best practices in everything we do. Amanda Rose says New Brunswick's pronoun policy has caused more bullying toward her transgender teen. She wants no more. Families of LGBTQ kids are not asking for you to, you know, support us. We're, we're asking to be left alone. As for how many Albertans get gender affirming surgery, provincial data shows in the last three years 312 patients received funding, but just over a quarter of those were between 18 and 25. Heather. All right, Sarah, thank you. Dramatic video from Kenya tonight where at least three people were killed in a massive explosion. <laughs> Hundreds more were injured when a truck loaded with liquid petroleum gas exploded in the capital city of Nairobi. The blast set off an inferno that burned nearby homes and warehouses. Three deaths have been confirmed with 280 people taken to hospital. And a fiery plane crash in Florida killed three people. Is there anybody else in this house? No, I think they're all okay. out. Go that that way. one's out. The small aircraft suffered an engine failure and smashed into a mobile home outside Tampa last night. The pilot had sent a distress call moments before the deadly plunge. The victims include the pilot and two people on the ground. Coming up, Maritimers hunker down. Getting our extra supplies and extra gas for the extra generator. Gas for the generator. <laughs> Preparing for a massive snowstorm. Plus, prognosticating rodents reach a consensus. Significant snowfall is expected in parts of the Maritimes this weekend as a storm barrels towards the region. Preparations are underway as some communities could see up to 80 centimeters of snow. CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Chris Anashkate has more. 
As the snow falls outside, there is a bit of uneasiness inside, with people preparing for the heavy amounts of snow to come. Right here today, getting our extra supplies. and Extra gas for, extra the, generator. Gas for the generator. <laughs> Not looking forward to it, that's for sure. Parts of Cape Breton are expecting between 40 to 80 centimeters of snow in the next three days, with even more snow on Monday. Officials are warning residents to avoid any unnecessary travel so crews can clear the roads safely. If the weather is getting as bad as they say, you should stay off the streets. Uh, give the plows time to plow, uh, salt the roads, and uh, try to be part of the solution, not the problem. This is all thanks to an Alberta clipper moving across the Maritimes, with Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI expecting to see 10 to 40 centimeters of snow. Travel will be slow and slippery, with up to 60 kilometer wind gusts that could impact ferry services. We're looking into Sunday, Monday is when the wind speeds are supposed to ramp up, so we've got some potentials out for later in the weekend. Advocates at this homeless encampment in front of Halifax City Hall say the cold and wet weather has had a significant impact on the people sleeping in tents and ice huts. Clothing gets wet, people are already sick, we have coughs, sometimes there's pneumonia sets in. Nova Scotia Power is predicting the snow to be drier this time, meaning it shouldn't build up on the trees or power lines. Still, crews will be on the ready this weekend. Chris Natchkate, CTV News, Halifax. For Canadians tired of wintry weather, there may be some good news, according to furry forecasters from three provinces. Three, two, one! No shadow. Hundreds watched as Ontario's Wyerton Willie emerged from hibernation to predict an early spring. Same groundhogs from Nova Scotia and Quebec also in agreement forecasting a short winter. Glad tidings on this Groundhog Day! An early spring is on the way! South of the border, all eyes on Punxsutawney Phil, who gave the same prediction. Still ahead, where's the money? Questions from angry investors and the unraveling of a crypto giant. Dubbed Canada's crypto king, Aidan Platursky is accused of ripping off investors of more than $40 million. Under investigation for fraud, today one of his associates was sentenced to time in prison. Here's W5's Avery Haynes. The only drug I'm addicted to is making mother money. That's the only drug I'm addicted to. And we just hit 100 followers. The so-called crypto king is traveling the world in luxury and live streaming to his fans. I'm not hiding anything from these guys. I've opened all my books up to them. Despite being forced into bankruptcy and accused of running a massive Ponzi scheme. He was building up this facade, this lifestyle that made it look like he was the success that he alleged to be. Aidan Platursky, a young man in his 20s from the suburbs, convinced hundreds of investors to hand over tens of millions of dollars to invest. People like Anna, whose identity we're protecting. I thought to myself that this, there's just something that continuously felt like it's not right, and I wanted to get my original investment out. Anna called authorities when her investment wasn't returned, and when other investors realized they wouldn't see their money again, a dramatic turn. I should have been honest with everybody when I told them I had lost a lot of money. Platursky was kidnapped and tortured in December of 2022, allegedly by angry investors. That kidnapping is still before the courts. And now W5 has learned that Platursky had feeder groups across Ontario, one in Chatham, run by a young man named Ryan Rumble, and one in Oshawa, run by this man, Colin Murphy. Well, let me ask you this. There are a lot of people whose lives have been really destroyed by investing with you. What do you have to say to them? Nobody invested with me. Colin Murphy has been found guilty of destroying evidence and sentenced to five months behind bars, the first of Platursky's associates to be punished. Ryan Rumble, who's also being investigated, has fled to Dubai. He's the subject of a class action lawsuit involving 125 investors in Chatham. The lead plaintiff is Emily Heim. It was my first time ever investing, right? So it was a huge deal for me. It wasn't money we just had sitting in an account. It was money we were borrowing. In bankruptcy hearings, it's alleged that almost none of the investors' money was ever traded, but used as Platursky's personal piggy bank, high-end cars, jewels, and lavish travel. Am I on federal charges? No, I'm not. No charges at all. Nothing criminal. 
Platursky has not been charged criminally, but he is the subject of a Police and Securities Commission investigation. Avery Haynes, CTV News, Toronto. And you can catch more of the investigation of the Crypto Bros on W5 tomorrow, airing on CTV at 7. After the break, saying goodbye to Carl Weathers, honoring the former NFL linebacker who became a Hollywood star. Generations of movie fans will remember the work of Carl Weathers, the football player turned actor whose breakout role in Rocky is legendary. Weathers passed away at the age of 76. Here's CTV's Jean-Via Boschman. An athlete on screen in his signature role. The whole world's gonna see the real Apollo Creed. Carl Weathers was also an athlete off the screen, but the action star would also go on to prove he could do so much more. It's always such a joy to provide entertainment for people who really enjoy what you do. Weathers was a college football linebacker and NFL player. He also played 18 games with the BC Lions. His card said that in his offseason, he studied acting. His inspiration, he once recounted, was watching The Defiant Ones, starring Sidney Poitier. Years later, Weathers starred in a TV remake. What is keeping him up, Bill? But his breakout role came in 1976, the part of boxer Apollo Creed, Rocky's brash theatrical nemesis. That low-budget sleeper went on to three Academy Awards. Weathers also played in three Rocky sequels. Time to go to school. His character dying at the end of Rocky IV. It really made an impact on fans all over the world, and I think that's how he'll be remembered, as someone who created an iconic character. It's a horrible loss and I'm standing here in front of this painting because it was probably the last moment we were ever in the ring together and I'll never forget it. He was magic and I was so fortunate to be part of his life. His athleticism was also on display in Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger in 1987. But he also took on tough social issues in the role of chief of police in the TV series In the Heat of the Night. Now you're threatening to commit a serious crime. Yeah. Oh. In 1996, he returned to playing an athlete, this Don't time in an Adam Sandler comedy as an alligator hating golf instructor. Today, Sandler described Weathers as a great dad, great actor, great athlete, someone everyone loved. You come here, little one. Another generation embraced him as he played an intergalactic bounty hunter in The Mandalorian of the Star Wars franchise. He also directed several episodes. In roles alongside Baby Yoda to Rocky Balboa, Carl Weathers showed off strength and heart. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. That's our show for this Friday. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night, and I'll see you again tomorrow.